and welcome back to the Pretty Serious Bike Racing Podcast for Monday, June 26th. We are less than a week out from the 2023 Tour de France. It's that one bike race that people you know have actually heard of, even if they're not into cycling. It's very exciting. It's a very exciting time of year, and we are going to talk all about the contenders for the Tour de France, and also people who are going to be contending for stages, people who will be outsiders for the title. There's lots to talk about with only a few days left before the biggest race of the year. We're also going to do a little bit of just a quick talk about nationals and maybe some takeaways from the Tour de Suisse women. Joining me this week, as ever, bike racing analyst extraordinaire, Cosmo Catalano. Cosmo, Welcome to the Mountain Time Zone again. Good to yeah. see you. Good to be here. Sunshine, dry air, not complaining. And not quite the like other side of the world, but pretty close. Very far away from us right now. Abby Mickey, you're nine hours ahead, so you're pretty pretty close to halfway across the world. From Latvia, the host of the Wheel Talk podcast. Abby, how are you? That sounds really far away when you say it like that. I mean, it is. Yeah, it's almost night where you are. It is night. Yeah. Well, it's still bright, but, but I guess you're you're like near the North sets. Pole, so yeah. Yeah, the sun sets at like four o'clock AM, so <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, we are gonna be talking about our picks, our outsiders. Uh I, I can't wait to have Cosmo actually make a pick because I I know it's his favorite <laughs> thing to do. It it is now because my last one was good. There we go. All right. We'll see if we can keep the streak alive. Uh, and yeah, lots, lots of Tour de France talk. We had a Tour de France route breakdown on the placeholders podcast the other day. So if you are into getting all of your Tour de France pre-race analysis audio style, then go listen to placeholders. You'll get a pretty in-depth breakdown of all of the 21 stages of the men's Tour de France. And we are going to talk about today. The riders, the the start list, as, as at least as far as we know it, uh, as of as of a few days before the race. All right. So before we dive in today, I have to tell you, I really want to tell you, listeners, about Escape Collective. We are a part of the podcast network, and the Escape Collective is member funded. That means that people like you, listeners, are what keep the Escape Collective going. And if you're not a member, then you should go become one. Head on over to escapecollective.com slash join and become part of the community. And while I'm on the subject of members, we are thanking our lifetime members on the podcasts this week, next week, the next few weeks. So let's do it today. We, we've got five people that I wanted to give a quick shout out to. Lee Chung, James Hosking, Felix Cartaschello, Dave Robbins, and Melissa Ix. Thanks so much for being lifetime members couldn't do it without support from folks like you again head on over to escapecollective.com slash join to become a member all right before we dive into the tour de france i really wanted to do a a little bit of a breakdown of what happened in the final few stages of the tour de suisse the last time we talked we were about halfway through the race and we have we'll talk host abby mickey on the show so abby just really quickly what what were the big takeaways from this race I think some of the big takeaways is just that SD works, even if it's not Demi Vollering or Kopecky winning, they still can win with any rider. I mean, the overall and the ITT stage, stage two, was won, won by Marlon Rooser, uh, another, like, obviously top, top, top rider on that team, but... They won two other stages that week with you talked about the first one being won by Blanca Voss, but they also won the final stage, stage four, with Neve Fisher Black, her first world tour win. So it was pretty awesome for any fan of Neve Fisher Black, of which the Wheel Talk podcast is three. But she beat fan favorite Kashini Wadoma to the line. And for both of the final road stages, stages three and four, uh, Kasha was really, really active trying to get off the front, basically just trying anything she possibly could to get any time. She kind of lost a lot of time in the TT and it was a stretch for her to try to take the overall, but she still, you know, did what we kind of know her for and was aggr- as aggressive as she possibly could. 
B. So I think main takeaways we've got off the top of my head. SC Works, still really freaking good. Kashini Odoma has a fire under her ass. I feel like part of it, can I swear? You can swear. I'm going to hit the okay. explicit button when I, I don't even. This. I don't even know that ass counts as a swear. I was reading this whole thing about how like the new parenting style is to just let your kids swear as long as they're not swearing at a, another human. I like it. Anyway, you that's should just not teach your kid to swear specifically in Latvian so that everybody else doesn't know that she's swearing. But that's then good. she's that's swearing idea. freely. Yeah, yeah, I should do this. So yeah, Cassia really wants to win and going into the Tour de France Femme of X Swift where she was third overall last year I think that she she's really targeting that race but she interestingly has some inner team competition for the first time ever in Chloe Dygart who just won the road race and time trial at the U.S. National Championships won her first world tour race at the Ride London Cycling Classic classique and is going to be a contender for the Tour de France Femme of X-Wift. So an interesting development with Kasia riding so well kind of in the road race portion of Tour de Suisse and not in the time trial and how that will be flipped when it comes to Digert on the when we're talking about the Tour de France Femme of X-Wift. Another interesting thing was Trek Segafredo really botched this one. I mean, they have maybe had some criticism I think over their tactics but they've also been praised for their tactics and I I guess that's how every team kind of functions but in this particular situation they ended up on the final day with the numbers in that group um, with Demi Vollering and Marlon Russo with Kasia up the road and Neve Fisher Black up the road you could say that Vollering and Marlon Russo were kind of isolated it was just the two of them and Demi was doing most of the work before Marlon Russo went off the front solo in in pursuit of Kasia and Neve Fisher Black. But Trek Segafredo just kind of sat there and they were happy to try to have Demi do the work. Now, I'm not a director. I don't know how to beat SC Works, but Trek Segafredo pretty much did nothing. And then when Marlon Russo went off the front to chase down the leaders, um, because Kasia was kind of like the virtual leader on the road for a minute there, Trek was kind of was caught out and there were three of them in that group and they were they just basically had to do a ton of work and still came away with nothing and Elisa longo was third overall um which is still like a decent result for her but they still they didn't really race like they were racing to win and I think that that will be that's kind of interesting going into the two bigger stage races of the year and Tour de Suisse being like this lead up race to the Giro now um how because it's like uh, two weeks before the Giro so now it's like a really interesting place in the calendar not something the women have really had before uh, a, a stage race that builds into a bigger stage race and I think if Trek Segafredo went to this race with their Giro team they're not coming out of it on the on a positive foot. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how they take that into the Giro that starts on Friday, especially with SC Works will not be starting this team at the Giro. There's a couple riders on the team that raced in, in Switzerland that will be going to the Giro. Blanca Voss, for example, and Nee Fisher Black. Check out the Tour Daily podcasts on Escape Collective for audio diaries from Neve Fisher Black for every day of the Giro Donna. Exciting, exciting thing. Yeah, She's cool. done them every year. We've had a podcast, well, at the other place, um, and they're fantastic. Uh, but they won't, obviously, like Demi Vollering won't be going. She's targeting the tour. Marlon Rooster, I'm not sure if she's going or not. It's not confirmed, but I would imagine she also is targeting the tour. So it looks like Trek Segafredo has their A team, and SC Works has their A minus team a (laughs) one but yeah i feel like that's i don't know those are my feels about the tour de suisse in a nutshell well i yeah thanks for the feels uh those are great feels in like a 10 minute nutshell (laughs) (laughs) i just thought it was cool uh, as much as it you know you could look at it on paper and be like oh well more s day works killing everybody but they really had to work for this like as as awkward as trek was riding um it was cool to see that that big Big day long break from from Chabay early, 
and Kashia making that big attack for virtual uh, Mayo Jean, Mayo Juan, Mayo Swiss Yellow, whatever the word is. Yeah, it was. It was. SD Works couldn't just sit there and and kind of be faster than everyone else. And I, I think it was actually kind of cool to see Royster not really run out of steam, but realize she wasn't going to catch that group, and that say holding on to yellow was just fine. But um, yeah, it was cool. I I I I like that kind of racing, even if on paper the results seem the same. And in the on the final stage, there it was also clear that Kasha. And Neve, who's an amazing climber, better climber than Kasia, but like she was gaining time on Marlin on the climbs. And so I feel like it definitely, I don't know if I, I said this in my like post race report ish on the site, escapecollective.com, that Kasia may have like es- exposed some cracks in SC Works. And I don't know if that's necessarily true. It might be a stretch, but I feel like she definitely tried. And what else can you do when you're up against a team as strong as them? They, they're they just like, they are like nearly unbeatable. They be- got beat only on stage three. And it was just because they just didn't win it. It wasn't like anything went wrong. They just didn't win. And it was because an Eleanor Gasparini won for UA team ADQ. But other than that, they would have taken all four stages of this stage race for the, I don't know, third time this year they've won like <laughs> every stage of a multi-day race. And so it's, yeah, they definitely, they just didn't have like, um, like a, poppy rider here Blanca Voss was amazing on stage one but it was a little bit of like a fluke like I wouldn't put her as a top sprinter up against someone like Arlena Sierra I think a lot of her win was positioning from Marlon Rusa and and Volering on the first stage and on the third stage they were playing a little bit more defensively they they really had to do a lot of work in the final kilometers of that stage to bring back Erska Ziggart who was off the front solo and behind Erska Ziggart there was a group of riders that included Cash and Iwadoma that was like really making more of an impact on the race than a solo rider off the front and so I, I think yeah the third stage they lost because they had to protect the overall but they yeah they still won three of four stages <laughs> uh, well Abby you mentioned uh Chloe Daggart winning an American national title. By the way, she won time trial and road. Uh, let's just do really quick jump over to the the nationals talk and just a, I don't know, try to highlight any any big takeaways for me. And I'm not just saying this because you're here, Abby. Awesome weekend for Trek. I'm looking across the board. They, I think part of it is that they 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 have a, a nicely international team, so they can go around winning a bunch of different national titles. They just have the they have the uh, uh, variety of of uh, international riders to do that. Tom Scoinch, of course, winning Latvian TT title. Uh, congrats to Tom's for that. He also mm-hmm. what he was third in the road race. Third, yeah. And but Emil's leap and kept Emil's, the jersey. Yeah, exactly. So also, I saw that Tom's went to McDonald's after. That was nice. And then across the board, Matthias Skelmosa, one of the many other. Uh, national champions, Amanuel, Gebrek, Xavier, uh, Elisa Longo-Borghini on the women's side. Yeah, bunch of national champions for Trek. So nice job to Trek for grabbing all those jerseys. Not too many huge surprises. Uh, Remco Evenepoel's ride at, at Belgian Nationals was pretty strong. Won the road race there. One of the things that he had not yet won. Fred Wright just won the British national title on the men's side. Seemed to be uh, an emotional moment for him. On the uh, on the Slovenian front, it was one of our few chances to see. Well, Erska Zigart won the women's TT title, and Erska Zigart's boyfriend uh, won the men's TT title and the road race. And that's actually the first time that we've really seen said boyfriend <laughs> really doing much since Liege uh, two months ago. Uh, and we're going to talk a lot about that fellow. But on the women's side, there was a couple national championships that they just, like, feel right. Like, you know, when it's a rider who you're just like, yes, I 
love to see you wearing your flag for a full year. Like Lada Kapeki, uh, one in Belgium, Demi Wallering, one in the Netherlands. We had Pfeiffer Georgie win in Great Britain and Elisa Longborghini taking the Italian one. <sighs> Amelia Fallon in Sweden. Like these things just feel like the the earth is in balance. I, I, I feel like with you can nationals, continue. you do often get kind of like, not randos, but yeah. It's such weird racing. That yeah. It's like, I've always thought it's a little silly, and I mean, I get it, but you can be far and away the best rider from a given country, and then to wear the jersey, though, you have to go back to the country, which may or may not be near the rest of the races you do the rest of the year, and compete maybe by yourself against a bunch of local guys who have no other goal in their uh, their campaigns except for getting this jersey. So it's it, it, I almost feel like there should be a a multi-step process, but I think from a viewership standpoint and from a like bike racing is cool standpoint, it, it works to have it be a single day championship. That was why it was cool to watch. I watched the men's British one and it was like most, it was pretty much all world tour riders like solo fighting against each other. And it was kind of, ent- it was entertaining to watch. All right, let's talk about the Tour de France and who we think will be the main protagonists for this race. I don't think anybody who listens to the Pretty Serious Bike Racing podcast will be surprised when I say that this looks like a two-horse race. Which, hey, that's a lot better than a lot of other Tours de France, which were a <laughs> one-horse race. Uh, but it really feels like there are two top-tier contenders, and then everybody else is like not even the next tier. They're like the third tier. I don't, I don't, I'm writing the, the uh, contenders preview right now for EscapeCollective.com, and... You know, we, we do these star ratings, you know, five stars, four stars, three stars. I don't really know that anybody gets four stars. I think there's two five-star favorites, and then there's just, like, everybody else. Uh, so, the two, the two five-star favorites, I think, are very clearly last year's winner, Jonas Vingago, and two-time winner, Tadej Pogacar. Both of whom have, obviously, the experience to go head-to-head and, and try to win this race, both of whom are extremely talented, and both of whom, in, in many ways, are actually pretty similar in their skill sets. I think both of them are excellent climbers. Well, I mean, top two climbers on the planet. Very good time trialists. Uh, but there are some differences, and I think we're going to see, I, I hope we're going to see both riders trying to you know use those the different advantages that they have to try to, get some time on the other with Pogacar. I think that's his punchiness. I think it's, you know, handling and explosiveness. I think he's just a better attacker across the board. Uh, and with Jonas Vingago, I think he's got a stronger team. It's maybe not as strong as it could have been with, with Primoz Roglic deciding not to race the race, but they really, they do seem pretty closely matched on everything. And, I think we're going to get a good battle, and we're going to, I think that's where we're going to see the, each rider trying to make the difference. I, I might push back a little bit on the similarity of their skill sets. Um, I think, you know, you see, and it could just be preference on, on Vingigo's part, but you don't see him contesting spring classics the way you saw a Pogacar testing, or contesting them this year. Uh, I think he's got, I do agree when you talk about that attacking spirit that he has. Like, he definitely will try, and I think has to, try and find moments where he can snatch away 10, 15 seconds throughout the first week of this race, which is relatively well suited for it, especially the first two stages. I think Vinigo clearly has an edge in the high, high mountains, but it's unclear how big that edge is because last year when we saw them throwing down, Pogacar really had done some dumb stuff earlier in stage 12, tracing Roglic. And then because he is an attacker and he wants to fight, he really kind of took himself out of the race trying to win it or or die, you know, <laughs> die doing it um, on stage, what was it, 17 or 18, the, with the last big mountain day. Uh, so I'm actually kind of curious to see what happens when they, they both ride a mountain racing for best time at the finish. I, th- I think the closest we saw was maybe Planche de Belfi, and that's not a big enough mountain to really let uh, Vingigo show how much better he, he is than Pogacar on these climbs. Yeah, I guess what I'm saying that they're similar, it's more just a relative thing in terms of Grand Tour contenders. This isn't Garen Thomas versus Mika Landa, who are... Fair. One is a, you know, 
big engine. One is, well, Mika Landa. That said, <laughs> there's only one TT this year. So we should talk about that. And we talked about that in the route preview, how this is very much a climber's Tour de France. Uh, even the one TT that is on this course has a hard, steep climb in it. So this is all about the climbers. The time trial abilities of both riders really won't come into play that much. And so I think those differences that you point out in their climbing abilities are actually going to be a big deal. So maybe they're not that closely matched for this Tour de France because they, they do have some differences in the way that they climb. And this Tour de France is all about climbing. Uh, there, there's just not going to be much of an opportunity for... Uh, well, I think they're going to take some time on the rest of the field in the TTs. But I, I would assume they'll be pretty closely matched in the TT and then it'll be all about climbing. And the route, it's very interesting. It allows for some very aggressive racing early on, which is not something that we often see at Grand Tours. Uh, we've... I mean, we often see that things are just kind of quiet. And I think the first few stages of this race, the first week really is full of stages that have steep enough climbs that there will be some gaps. So there's plenty of opportunity for attacks there. I think on the one hand, Tadej Pogacar is the the better rider when it comes to punchy climbs. I mean, you don't win Liège without that kind of ability. But he's also coming into this race with a significant time spent off the bike and and it, more importantly, maybe a significant time spent out of competition because of the injury he suffered in April. So we really only saw him racing at nationals. And I think that's the big question mark here is what is Pogacar's form? Is he at a hundred percent? Is he at 90%, 80%? I mean, you don't win two national titles in Slovenia, which is a country that has some pretty good cyclists being at 50%. So I think he's at least pretty close to his best uh but is he at his very best and we're going to find out early and i think that's one area where yumbo visma jonas vingo's team might be trying to take advantage uh, of this course and, and possibly see if they can get some time in before pogaccio works his way into form might have to push back again about the form bit with pogaccio just because you know he won the time trial by five minutes and earlier this year, in his early races, was the the Jean Paraiso, the the the, the kind of Spanish uh, Strada Bianca, really just his first race of the season, first like European race of the season, just rode away from everybody. Like, this is a tune-up race. I'm ready. I'm dialed. There was one point where he he got a time check and then kind of shook his head and smiled because he, he was two minutes ahead with you know 14k or something left in the race. So I think this is a rider who's really demonstrated they don't maybe need that top, top edge. They don't need uh, lots of competition to get to that top, top level. Uh, I guess we'll find out, but another thing where, in case you can't tell, I am I am pretty pro Pogacar here. So. All right, so I'm actually, I think, I think I'm on the Pogacar side of the equation here as well. I think that even if he's at 90%, I actually think he can still win the race. I think he's still good enough. Abby, we know because I asked you beforehand <laughs> to set up this head-to-head, that uh, you, I think, of the two, see Vingago as the more likely winner. And because this is 2023 version of Sports Talk Radio, I think we've got to go head-to-head here. Why do you think Jonas Vingago is, is the more likely of the two riders here to win this race? He won last year's tour, and I think that that just kind of solidifies in his own mind that it's something he can do. And I think that he maybe wasn't the most confident last year. So coming into this tour, I think he, he does have a little bit more confidence, but I think he also worked on some things that would, um, that Pogacar is better at, for example, his explosiveness. Like if you watched him race the Dauphiné and even like Basque, he was incredibly attacky he was like really aggressive not really the vinigo that we have seen before in the past he was a very different rider and he he was really keen to animate the race and that's not the same guy we saw won the tour so i think that he's ready for what pogacar is going to throw at him this year and he's worked on it and mentally i think he's in a better place than he's ever been having won the tour and kind of dealt with what that means uh, and what it what it means for him in the moment, what it means going forward in his career. And so I think given how he rode at the Dauphiné where he was really like a head and shoulders above everyone else and going into the tour, I think he has a better team around him, uh, a, a, like a better support system. And he's a 
bit more of a stable guy. Like he's not going to do anything dumb and attack at stupid points, but he clearly has been working on the explosiveness to be able to follow Pogacar if he does do something dumb. That's a very reasonable argument that you make. So Cosmo, uh, do you have a rebuttal? And if so, can you like shout it and like be a little angry? I, Cause I, <laughs> I just feel like that's what people want, right? I, I can get the, that level of anger for, like, dumb administrative decisions. But honestly, it's not a bad take. Like, P- Vinigo has looked outstanding this year. But he's been outstanding at stuff I think he's already outstanding at. He, he's done a lot of, like... He's been attacking, but he's been attacking in terrain where he's already been good. You know, he's he's he didn't, he's never looked bad as a descender. He looked fine descending. He's, he seems like he's ready for the mountains. But I, I think there's a type of racing, a type of pressure that you get in the classics that is the only thing that kind of comes close to that first week of the Tour de France where everything is crazy. And to come into the Dauphiné and smack everybody around is very different than to show up at Mini Classica San Sebastian and keep your head on straight as crazy attacks are going and strong riders are getting away. And I think Pogacar, because he has that classics experience and has done very, very well there, can get together with a lot of guys he knows and has ridden with and tear the race apart and, you know, Jumbo Visma is a very strong team regardless, but I think Krausweg is out, right, for the tour because he has a, a broken collarbone. You have Wout Van Aert uh, will probably be invaluable in that first week, but you know, if, he, if, he's, if he's leaving the tour when his, his wife starts having a kid, that is something that could happen on uh, stage, you know, 20 or something can happen on stage one. Uh, I, I, I think if you are... I hate to say this as a parent, but I think if you are fully committed to your tour leader, you're going to be committed to your tour leader, regardless of when childbirth happens. So I, well, I think Yumbo is strong. There's no Kreuzwick and Wout is on baby watch. So maybe those things could both put a serious dent in Vinigo's chances. I still think there are openings for Pogacar. Okay, first, Cosmo, that was a highly respectful and logical argument. Again, I don't know how we're going to be playing clips of you saying that you know, Abby's take is trash if you're going to be so respectful. And that's just not going to play here. <laughs> it's because it's not trash. It's a really good take. On on on, uh, on Sports Talk Radio. <laughs> Abby, rebuttal. Go. I, I respect your take. I think that you make some really good points. Abby, come on. You don't respect Cosmo as a person. You don't The classics are dumb. Take. No one knows about the classics. No one cares about the classics. But the classics are really, really different from a 21-day stage race. And if Pogacar is going to race this race like the classics, then he's going to lose because you can't race like that for 21 days straight and win the race in the end. You could win a bunch of stages, but that's not the yellow jersey. And so I think that racing it in classic Pogacar style, especially with the the challenging stages on the back end um like stage 17 looks nasty um and stage 20 looks nasty like there's some there's some really hard stages in in the end which i think if pagacha is racing really aggressively like we saw him do last year then he could run into a little bit of trouble with fatigue going into the final week but that also is where Jonas could run into trouble if Wow is gone, um, which I assume he will be gone by stage 17. So that could be interesting. Also, like if you're looking at um, the strength between the two teams, obviously without Roglic and and with Wow one foot out the door, the Yumbo Visma team is a little bit down, especially since Sep just raced the Giro. So I think he will be super valuable, but he will he. He also just raised the Giro. And if you look at kind of the team around Pogacar, it's definitely, I think, leaning towards being a stronger roster, especially in service of one guy. Um, But I I still think that there... I don't see Pogacar beating Jonas when it comes to this race. I, I think a lot of it has to do with his form and how he's feeling having spent multiple week or multiple months out out of the peloton i think if there's a guy that can like not race and come back and just like destroy everybody then pagachar is your guy but i still think that those those extra race watts Jonas has them over him at the moment and that might be enough just to balance pagachar's explosivity than what Jonas is lacking the only thing i'm going to rebut a little bit on that is that uh, you did mention how 
you can use that kind of Pogacar attacking against him, and that will wear him out as the race goes on. But that's also a lot of what happened to him last year. So I think they're going to be ready for that trick. Uh, not that there's a Roglic to send up the road, but I think I think the team car is going to be maybe keeping him on a tighter leash on days that aren't pure Pogacar days on paper. And maybe Yumbo can pull something on those early days um, on that mini San Sebastian where they trick Pogacar into losing time. But I think he's going to be a lot smarter that doesn't mean he won't attack, but he's be smarter about his attacks and where he chooses to go. Yeah, but you're like banking on the fact that one, the team car can rein him in <laughs> at all. <laughs> and two, that he actually learned from his mistakes. And that's why he kind of started to lose his edge at the end. It could have been something else entirely. We will see. In just a dun, few days. Dun, time. Dun. Nice. All right, so those are the two big top tier favorites. There are some other riders. There are some contenders who are going to be waiting in the wings just in case something happens. And this is Tour de France. Anything can happen. It's a bike race. Anything can happen. And the very best favorite does not always win the race. There are some dark horses. Cosmo, I think your dark horse is probably the best position. Certainly one of the best positions. The best best dark horse? Who you got? Who's your... I'm pick. I'm picking Jai Hindley. Um, I'm only picking because Dane made me pick a dark horse uh, pick. That did happen. But I will say, uh, he his Grand Tour win uh, was very very clever. He was very smart. He kept his head low and waited until the one day he waited. It was like he was you know waiting for that perfect gambler, waiting for that perfect hand, and just put everything on it and snuck away with the race in the kind of closing days. And um, if we see. Pagachar and Vinigo really wail on each other over all these mountains kind of throughout the race because I think there are three mountain-ish stages in the first week alone. They finish on Puy de Dome before the first rest day, which is an absurdly steep climb the Tour hasn't done in 30 years, 40 years, a long time. There might be an opportunity for someone that calculating and smooth who's been out of the spotlight and been keeping his powder dry to, to, to do something tricky. Yeah, I think uh, the, the odds makers tend to agree that he's sort of an, the next man up. The, the, I mean, a, a clear, a distant third to the first two. But of anybody, he, yeah, as, a, as a recent Grand Tour winner, as somebody who has targeted this tour, he's a rider who, yeah, if something goes wrong, if there's a catastrophe for Vinkago or Pogacar, he certainly looks like a potential contender to win the race. He did beat some pretty big names at the Giro that he won. Uh other people kind of at that sort of second tier or third tier, if you just want to say there's no second tier, I mean, there's like Enric Moss, Richard Carapaz riding for EF, brand new team, and and I think he may be somehow a little bit flying under the radar since he's not at Ineos anymore. I think at, at, at Ineos he would always have a little bit of of attention on him. David Godu over at Groupama FDJ. Uh, who knows what he's going to be capable of. But all four of those, of those riders, Henley, Enric Moss, Carapaz and David Gadu, they're all going to be very happy with the route because I don't think any of them are going to be able to beat uh, Pogaccio or Vingago in a race that has more time trials. Uh, so they're going to be happy with that. I'm curious about Gaudu, um because he, well, usually, like, I'm a Gaudu believer, uh, but if you just kind of look at his results in the last couple months, he got he was fourth at Basque, which isn't bad, and second overall at Perry Nice, also not bad. But he DNF'd all three Ardennes, and he was thirtieth overall at the Dauphiné. And I just don't know how I feel about him going into the Tour. Yeah, I actually feel like basically all of these riders, there's like some up and down form going on where they were great at one point and then they weren't, and it's just hard to say what what we're gonna. But yeah, Gaudu in particular. Uh, Definitely had some, oh, yeah, he wasn't that great moments uh, <laughs> over the past few months. And that's why he's not tied up with and Jonas Van Gogh. He beat Vinigo at Pyrenees, but that was in March. Yeah, he was awesome there. Some months since March. It has. Yep. So, Mark Matteo, last year's tour, doing the Tour de France Unchained, he sets up this whole storyline. It's all his thing, where Gaudu is going to be the, the main contender. Mm. And I see Pinot going is going to be the not main contender. Take the pressure off Pinot 
So now on his final season, Pino can come in totally under the radar and win a Tour de France. Yeah. Mm. Wouldn't that be amazing? And if Groupama de- FDJ does not deliver, AG2R Citroën will be there to potentially propel, well, a non-Frenchman, but at least it's a French team to the win. Abby, why do you like Ben O'Connor so much for this race? I love Ben O'Connor. And for this race in particular, he just finished third at the Criterium de Dauphiné behind Jonas Vinigo and Adam Yates. So ahead of Jai Hindley. So he's at the moment, in theory, on good form. And I think that he has proven that he's quite a um, mature rider. And going into this tour, I think he's got a lot of elements that in his favor that he kind of just needs to piece together. I I like his team for this race. I think that he's got a pretty strong team around him, especially Felix Gall, who had an incredible ride at the Tour de Suisse. I think that, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see how the rest of the team is going to be able to support him, but there's some good guys on there. A lot of, um, there's a couple good Belgian guys. Obviously Greg Van Avermaet is a incredible, um, like captain on the road for them. And I think, yeah, I think he's got a lot of pieces. He just needs to put them together. But I think overall, I'm really excited about how he could do at the tour this year. I'm going to give a quick shout out to my sort of fringe pick. He actually rides for the same team as one of the two favorites. And I think he's going to be a little bit under the radar as a contender. And if they're smart, maybe they'll try to, you know, send Adam Yates up the road. He did just finish second to Jonas Vingago at the Dauphiné. He won the Tour de Romedy. He was a distant second at the Dauphiné. But the Tour is a little farther out, so maybe he's just working his way into shape. He's a rider who has always been talked about as, you know, a big Grand Tour guy. Hasn't quite delivered on that promise. But I can tell you one thing he did do is win San Sebastian in 2015. This race is going to be going on those roads. Uh, Interesting circumstances in which he won the race that year. Whatever, that's fine. I think he's he's got the punchiness to maybe surprise the people in the first week and possibly take advantage of an opportunity to try to put pressure on Yumbo Visma. You never know. I really like that 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 pick. I think he's got a similar like you can almost some people I think may be criticized racing for second, but he's very smart about when he makes efforts in these races where he's. He's not winning, but he's finishing second, and he's finishing second because he's smart about it. And, you know, all it takes is one blown corner, one overlap of wheels, and that racing for second is suddenly you protecting what turned into your GC lead in the last week of the race. Yeah, I, I think he he has the race craft uh, to, to potentially to be up there. It just kind of depends on what happens with his team leader, with, with Yumbo, et cetera. I also like his, his brother. I, I do think Simon Yates over at Jayco has a chance. Uh, and then lastly, let's let's give a shout out to Matthias Skielmoza, who a month ago I wouldn't have really thought about as a as an outsider for the Tour de France. And now I think he's like a legit, you know, third tier guy. Uh, this guy seems like the limit for him. He's so young. He's only 22. He was incredible at the Tour de Suisse. He just won the uh, Danish Road Race title, by the way. I, I, yeah, I don't really know what to expect from Skelmosa, but I have learned not to underestimate him in the last month, and so I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing him. Yeah, giving it a go at his first ever Tour de France, seeing what he can come up with. It, we just don't have enough to go on in terms of what to expect, but the form was absolutely there at the Tour de Suisse, where he was able to, yeah, surprise everybody. I don't, I don't think, I think it's fair to say it was a big surprise to see him win, and. Uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing what he can do here at the Tour de France. I think for Skelmos, I'm interested to see how the team kind of uses him because obviously coming off of Tour de Suisse, there it would be hard for them to look at how he rode there and how he's currently riding and not be like, okay, we want him to try to go for GC. But their team is like not, I don't know how much they could support a rider for GC. They've got like Chicone on there, but he will have his own ambitions. Tony Gallopin is an amazing captain and, and climber and would be a good asset for that. But the rest of the team, oh, one Pedro Lopez, obviously, but like Jasper and, and Mess and Alex Kirsch, they're all going to be a, on the stage hunt. And I think like Chicone could fall into that as well. So when it comes to Skelemos, I, yeah, I'm curious what, what the heck they're going to do with him if they're gonna 
try to let him like surf into the GC on his own with limited assistance from the rest of the guys, or if they're going to be like, okay, scrap the plan. We're, we're riding for this guy. <laughs> I, I think there were a couple of times this spring where Chicone and Skilmos, Skilmosa didn't quite seem to be on the same page in terms of what the team plan was. And I'm really hoping that doesn't happen at the tour. Like whatever mm-hmm. it is, I want to see like good riders execute as well as they can. I know it, it, sells papers or whatever the modern equivalent is uh, to have an inter-team rivalry like that. But it's, you know, I think these guys work too hard. Everybody in cycling works too hard to have that be the, the, the main headline. All right, lastly, in the GC conversation, I really quickly want to talk about the team that has won this Tour de France, this race, a, a billion times recently, but probably isn't going to do so this year. Uh, they are bringing Egon Bernal to the Tour de France, the Ineos Grenadiers, at least according to all reports. I'm really excited about that. I, I think I've been very clear that I, I like can't wait to see him get back to his best. I really hope that he does, uh, and I'm I'm very excited that he's going to be finally back at the tour after his horrible injuries last year. They'll also have Tom Pitcock. The sky's the limit for him too. Who knows what to expect from him? He certainly won a pretty climby stage last year, and I think this team does see him as a GC rider for their future. So they bring a pretty good team. Uh, oh, also Danny Martinez. Yeah. Uh, I, they're certainly not the favorites that they would have been five years ago, but Ineos does have some talent at this race, and we'll see what they can do. All right, let's talk about some of the stage hunters and, and maybe the other jerseys. Uh, the sprint field, to me, looks like, first of all, it's a pretty strong sprint field. Uh, second of all, I think it's really exciting that maybe a decade ago there were there was always this like top three riders of who we could just expect one of them to win everything. That's really not the case anymore, and it feels like things are a lot more wide open. Uh, it does, to me, feel like the favorites are probably Jakobsen, Fabio Jakobsen, and Jasper Philipsen, Jasper Disaster. Uh, looking <laughs> forward to more unchained excitement on those storylines. Uh, and then, yeah, Dylan Grunewagen looks pretty good in Slovenia. Uh, there's Caleb Ewan, who's, I think, a little bit more versatile. There's Wout van Aert, who can win... I mean, I think he's. I think Wout van Aert will be like among the top five favorites for every stage in this Tour de France, uh, and he would be a shoe in for Green. I think if we didn't have the prospect of him planning to possibly leave when his second child is born at some point in July, as expected. Matthew Vanderpool is there. Mess Peterson is there, and of course, Mark Cavendish. Will he be able to break that Tour de France stage wins record? I think it'll be close. I actually, I think he's going to be able to do it uh, because it's, a, like I said, a pretty wide open field. We'll see. There has been a request at the uh, event that I am at uh, that we discuss green skin suits and whether or not they are acceptable, uh, specifically re- with reference to Wout and his extremely green skin suit last year. <laughs> okay, well, I fall in the camp of it's one of my favorite looking kits there is. So I, I like the kit, the skin suit. The green from, you know, neck to... Yeah, to, to, to really. I love it. That's a lot of green. He looks like uh, a spaceman. I love it. Uh, okay. <laughs> it gives him wings, Cosmo. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think that a little bit of styling, and I know they probably have limited ability uh, around what the leader's kits look like, but some sort of visual element to add some shape other than just green and human body uh, yeah. would be lovely. Yeah, all right, fair enough. Uh, I, I think the green jersey battle is going to be really interesting this year because if Wat van Aert does leave the race, things suddenly become wide open. I think you got, you got Jakobsen and Philipsen as possibly the two best sprinters maybe contending for it. Matty van der Poel is an option. Uh, Caleb Ewan is a bit more versatile. He might be in the mix, tends to be up there. Yeah, I think that the, the green jersey battle will be really interesting if Van Aert is out of the race. And if he's not out of the race, I would assume he's going to run away with it. It, it is interesting in, in Tour de France Unchained when they debuted the Asper Disaster nickname that uh, the, the directors were specifically like, we need to get rid of that. And now it's going to stick with him forever because it's actually kind of an awesome nickname. I think if he keeps winning, it will be like a a great thing. I'm sure they'll come around on the idea if he keeps winning and it becomes a easily marketable thing. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing Jasper disaster possibly, possibly causing some issues uh, with his own team and then having a dramatic victory or two here and there. Uh, and then lastly, the, the sort of the, maybe the more climbery intermediate stages, 
who we're going to watch on those. I think that conversation also dovetails into the, the KOM battle because it's going to come down to probably Vigigo, Pogacar, and whoever gets into the most breakaways in the mountains, uh, which is often, you know, the GC riders that we just talked about, the ones who kind of fall back a little bit, those guys tend to be up there. I do think Julia Ciccone is another one who's really interesting to watch for that. Obviously, he has some experience fighting for mountains titles, having won the Giro Mountains title. Just won a stage at the Dauphiné. Awesome climber is Ciccone. I think he's a real real threat for that. Uh, other riders who will be in the mix on the lumpier stages, Julian Alaphilippe is a big name to watch, particularly early in the race when there are some San Sebastian-style stages. That is his thing. That's what he's best at. And, you know, who knows what to expect from him. The, the form has been on and off, and, and, and yet... This is the Tour de France, and, you know, I think he'll be in good shape. Yeah, looking forward to seeing Sergio Aguita. Don't really know what, what he's going to be up to. Uh, Mike Woods. He looks pretty good at the, 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 the Route del Satani. No Chris Froome on the Israel Premier Tech team. Uh, Matteo Jorgensen, another rider who I think could really do something at this Tour de France. Before you kind of close out, the f- exciting riders to watch. I have my eye on Uno X um, pro cycling team. I feel like they have a lot of cool riders on their roster and I'm excited to see how they go. And especially being, this is a huge opportunity for that team to be in this race. And so I think that they've lined up their best of the best and of, that they have to offer. And I think that they're going to be, fighting for for some stage wins i think they'll be really exciting especially torstein train train the norwegian rider the 27 year old norwegian rider on the team he's a super exciting rider to watch i think i like that you identified him as the norwegian rider on a team that is (laughs) only norwegian and danish i see how that's funny and (laughs) yeah (sighs) yeah Uh, it would be pretty awesome if Alexander but like Christoph. Rasmus Tiller, Alexander Kristoff, like good riders. Yeah, totally. That would be, that'd be pretty great to see. Uh, you know who I feel bad for at this Tour de France is Stefan Kung and really anybody else whose thing is to be a time trialist, like on flat mm-hmm. time trial stages. That There's just, there's not a lot of opportunities. Even the one TT in this race, like that's got a 9% climb in it. And, but we might yeah. have the best Canadian finisher in a Tour de France like ever. <laughs> You mean because of that? Yeah. Because of the lack of a time trial? Yeah. I feel like that's... A lot of countries are thinking the same, you know? We might have the best French finisher in a while because, of, because you know, all, all due respect to David Godou, not the best time trialist. Yeah. I mean, I guess just until Derek decides, like, that he's going to be a GC rider. Could happen. All right. Totally. Yeah. I think we've run down the start list comprehensively enough. At this point, we might as well just sit back and enjoy the show. The Tour de France starts on July 1st, which is right around the corner. It starts in Bilbao, which is in Spain's Basque country, and then it will head into France. Lots to look forward to in the first several days, actually. Not just uh, not your t- traditional short TT or sprint stages. There's a bunch of punchy stages in the early going, so we've got a lot to look forward to there. At the men's Tour de France. Also, the Girodone is coming up. Obviously, the Will Talk folks will be talking about the Girodone. Abby, you're going to be making some appearances on the Tour de France Daily Pod for that. Yeah, I will have daily coverage of the Giro with none other than Uno X writer Hannah Barnes Woo. on the Tour Dailies, along with audio diaries from Nee Fisher Black, Brody Chapman, Nina Kessler, Veronica Ewers. A lot of really exciting audio diaries to check in for. And uh, we're going to have a big preview over on the Wheel Talk podcast coming out on Tuesday with Rebecca Charlton. So make sure to check that out. So lots more to listen to in the coming days and weeks. We're going to be in Tour de France daily mode before you know it. So obviously tune in for those if you can. Enjoy the start of the Tour de France and we'll see you when we see you. Thanks, Cosmo. Thanks, Abby. Thank you.